And verse number 28. Levi the publican, chapter number 26, verse 28. Six twenty-eight. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Yes. Father, anoint your word now, Lord, and anoint the messenger. I pray you'd bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. The Lord Jesus took the Passover, and then by taking the Passover, the foundation had already been laid. They understood that by the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin without it. He said in Leviticus 17, verse 11, the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you upon the altar for an atonement for the soul. The blood's the only organ in your body that touches every part of your body. Therefore, it covers all of your body. The blood, therefore, is representation of life. It is life. Therefore, the Lord Jesus Christ is giving his life's blood for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25 says, After the same manner also he took the cup. When each sup saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. So the Lord had simply laid down for us the notion and the idea and the and the command, I guess you'd call it that, that we take his, that we take this Lord's Supper in perpetuity until he comes back, until he returns. And we do it in remembrance of him. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter number 3 and verse 6 says, Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. So we minister the New Testament. Now, let me say this for you tonight. We do not have clergy and laity. That's a created thing. That's a man-made piece of garbage. We have able ministers. Every one of us, our royal priesthood, have access to God the Father, and we can minister the New Testament. We can minister the Word of God. The Bible says in Matthew chapter number 22, verse 34, When the Pharisees had heard that he'd put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is likened to it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now here's what he says in verse 40. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. So don't ever let anybody tell you the Old Testament was foundation was the law. The Old Testament foundation was love. And it was true love. It was the love of God and for God. But notice that it's important to see the context of this. Remember, we are able ministers of the Spirit, of the New Testament, not of the law, not of the written word. There's some folks can never get above or past the written word. Listen, there's nothing wrong with the written word. That's a wonderful thing, but it must be ministered by the Spirit of the living God. What does that mean? That means that we understand life for life. Life ministers to life. Not the dead letter of the law, but the living spirit that is in us. We have an understanding of each other. We know what humanity is about. We understand people and we minister to them by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. No man is an island to himself. We don't live unto ourselves. We're not, of our, we're not our own. Everybody in this house tonight has problems. You all have fears. You all have sorrows. You all have doubts. All of these things are common to mankind. And therefore we minister to these things. Not as some kind of a mechanical ottoman. Some kind of a, uh, of a, of a, of some kind of a statue or something like that. We are living and we are ministering the life. And by ministering life we reach to life. And that's the way it ought to be. Now if, what you're hearing and what you're hearing ministered to you does not speak to your soul and speak to your life. You're not being ministered to. You may be, you may be brought under some kind of a doctrinal situation where your brow beat to death and people are controlling your life and that goes on a lot. But without the ministry of the spirit, your spirit will die. And you have to have that. But here the Pharisees heard that he'd put the Sadducees to silence. 
Now, when did he do that? I preached about that this morning. Remember? In Mark chapter number 12, verse 28. And one of the scribes came, having heard them reasoning together, and, pierced, and perceiving that he'd answered them well, ask him, which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. There's nowhere in the Old Testament, folks, you can look at it for yourself. There's nowhere in the Old Testament that tells you that's the first commandment. So how did they know that? They knew that by the discernment of the Spirit of the living God. They were able to look past the written law into the spirit of that law. And that's what the Lord Jesus is trying to tell them. For back in the book of, second, back in the book of uh, Matthew 22, the Pharisees came to him not to learn some spiritual truth. They really didn't want to know the answer to the question that they gave him. Their purpose was to catch him in his words. Their purpose was to, to, to use the scripture as a, as, a, as a stick to beat someone over the head with. Or as a trap to, to entrap them. And the Lord knew that, of course. But here, when he's dealing with this scribe, he says, Jesus answered him. The first of all the commandments is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And then he continues to quote Deuteronomy chapter number 6. And then the Bible says in verse number 34 of Matthew 12, Mark 12, And when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he answered discreetly, because in verse 32 he said, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but he. Is this the truth? Amen. Certainly it's the truth. Did this Old Testament believing Jew know the, tr know the, know the truth? Yeah. Of course he did. But you see, here's the thing about truth. You shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. Yeah. What does that mean? That means that if you accept the truth, you'll get more truth. If you accept the light, you'll get more light. You see, when Apollos was preaching in the book of Acts, he knew only the baptism of John. Right? That's all he knew. But when Priscilla and Aquila went to him and instructed him further in the word of God, they instructed him how that Christ had died for their sins, had risen, and now was at the right hand of the Father. What did Apollos do? Re did he rebel against them? No, because what Apollos knew was based on the truth. Was John the Baptist a preacher of truth? Of course he was. So what he was preaching was the truth as he knew it and as far as he knew it. But when more truth came to him, he received it and accepted it. And that's the principle of the scripture. This is what the Lord's talking about. Notice carefully what he says in verse number 33, 32. The scribe said to him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God and there is none other but he. And the Lord Jesus does not rebuke him anywhere because he agreed entirely with what he said. Now continue on. To love him with all your heart, all your understanding, all your soul, with all your strength. To love the neighbors thyself. As, to, to love his neighbor as himself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. You see, he said to the others, on all the law hangs this. This, he says, is more than all of the burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now notice carefully, when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, that word only shows up one time in the New Testament, right here, right here. Here is a Jew who knew the truth, stood on the truth, and the Lord Jesus was about to give him more truth. That's what works. That's the way it works. And so when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. That's what we're doing tonight. Will this save you? No. You can eat all of the bread. You can drink all of the wine or the grape juice. And it'll do you no good whatsoever unless you can look past the physical into the spiritual. John says in John chapter number 6, you can't eat his flesh. He's not here today. But he said, these words that I say unto you, they are spirit and they are life. In plain words, it takes the spirit to discern the spirit. If you'll receive the spirit, you'll understand the spirit. The Bible teaches us that the Holy Ghost is our unction. He's our teacher. And he said, you have no need that any man teach you if the Holy Spirit is living within you. And here's the problem. People come and they take this and they think, well, now this is part of my salvation or this is keeping me saved or, you know, something of that nature. No, it's not. There is no power in this whatsoever. We can wave our hand across it and pray over it. That doesn't change it. Here's what matters. What's in your heart? In plainer words, what is your soul thinking? 
What is your spirit doing when you take this? That's what matters. Because you will be as the scribe, you will be able to discern that to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul, and all thy being is greater than every one of those words over there in Exodus chapter number 20 that says, Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. The Ten Commandments given in Exodus number tw chapter number 20, they're wonderful commandments. They manifest the righteousness of God, but the greatest commandment in all of the Old Testament. That's what he's talking about. What is the first commandment? The rich, this, this scribe knew what it was. He knew it, he knew it in his soul. And so the Lord Jesus knew he knew it. And their minds met, their hearts met, their souls met. And instead of speaking to them like you generation of vipers, you know, he talked to the Pharisees like that. Instead, he said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. I believe with all of my heart he got there. <laughs> so why do you believe that? Because he believed the truth. You'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. Amen. If you want a lie, you can believe a lie, but you'll always have to believe another lie to believe a lie. Because a lie can't stand on its own. It must be propped up by another lie. First thing you know, you follow this lie to that lie to this lie to that lie, and you're surrounded with lies. That's what's happening to our kids today, a whole generation. Lie, 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 lie. But you hear the truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The Lord Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. So that brings us down to this. And I won't keep you long with it, but I think it's a beautiful thing. So he got the first commandment by spiritual discernment. He knew what it was. He got it from God. He knew that. It didn't contradict the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. It just raised him to a higher level. It raised him to a point that do not, do not, do not, do not can never get you. You see, it raised him to a place because spiritual discernment will bring you in to the presence of God. When he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will not speak of himself. For whatsoever he shall hear, he'll speak that. he show you things to come. The Holy Spirit will draw you to the Father. And he'll do his job. So the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter number 9, verse 15, For this cause he's the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Aren't you glad for all the eternal things when it comes to dealing with God? Not temporal, eternal. He gives you eternal life, eternal security. He gives you an eternity compared to this Compared to this temporal existence, this earth will melt with fervent heat. That's what Peter said. He said the elements will melt. It's going to be gone. So if everything you've got is piled up on this earth, just get ready. One day, <laughs> it's all going to be gone. Lay up treasures in heaven where the moth and the thief cannot corrupt. But he said in verse nine, Hebrews 9, 16, For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Now, I want to get into this one more time with you, and then I'll come to a close tonight. But it's important if you'll understand what's going on with this. He talks to a testament. He said, this is the New Testament. This is the blood of the New Testament. He called it the testament. But then in Hebrews chapter number 8, when he began to deal with Israel, same word, he changed it from testament to what? Covenant. Now, why didn't he use covenant back here where I read it to you? This is the new covenant of my blood. It's this reason. Testament is all-inclusive. It reaches everybody. Jew, Gentile, bond, free, rich, poor, red, yellow, black, and white makes no difference. It is the New Testament of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When he died on the cross, that was given to all of us. But he has a covenant. And that covenant is with Israel. And this is another of the reasons I am not a British Israelite. Because in Hebrews chapter number 8 is as clear as it can be. The day will come when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. This covenant is diatheke, just like translated testament. But the application is different. And this is the way you understand the Bible. Look at verse number 6 of Hebrews 8. Now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Hebrews is talking to the Hebrews. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. 
Hebrews 8.8, 8, For finding fault with him, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the church. It won't work, will it? You can ram Gentiles in there all you want to, but it won't work. A covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. That's as plain as it can be. Hebrews 8, 9. Not according to the covenant that I made with your fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Why? Because that covenant was based on a promise and a prophecy, but it could not cleanse the hearer or the comer thereto. The sins could never be forgiven. They could only be pushed forward. It took the death of Christ to forgive all sin. He made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Us alive, them in the past, those in the future. He became sin for all mankind. Now Hebrews 8 verse 10 says this. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. He's quoting Jeremiah chapter 31. In verse number 34 of Jeremiah 31 it says, And they shall teach no man, everybody, every man his neighbor, uh, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. That's what Jeremiah said. Isaiah said it this way, For the earth should be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Habakkuk says it this way, For the earth should be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Is that today? Of course not. No, it never has been. You have millions out there that have never even heard the name of Christ. So what's going on? Well, look at Hebrews 10 verse 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and their minds will I write them. And not on stone, but in their soul. Hebrews 10, 29. Now, it'll help you understand this verse, because this is a biggie. This is a stickler with a lot of people. Remember now, in the book of Hebrews, when he uses the word covenant, he's no longer talking to Gentiles. He's talking to Jews. Look at Hebrews 10, 29. This is a biggie. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye that he shall be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the, what? Wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, hath done despite to the Spirit of grace. Who are we talking to here, a Jew or a Gentile? For the, maintain the consistency. A Jew. Exactly. We're talking to a Jew. We're not talking to a Gentile. Who am I today to get up here and tell you that if you've turned away from Christ, there is no more sacrifice for your sins, and there's no forgiveness for you, and there's no hope for you? How many people in this house have turned away from him for a while? How many got cold? How many got mad at God? How many you know, left the church and said, well, I'm done with him? Yet you came back. And when you came back, he brought you back. <laughs> he forgave you, cleansed you. Amen. But he's telling somebody here in Hebrews chapter number 10 that if you walk on this covenant... There's no forgiveness. You see what I'm saying? He's saying, Jews, Christ is the covenant. You've been told about the covenant because they had been. Now you, you, now you sin against that covenant and there's nowhere for you to go. There's no hope for you. You've done despite to the spirit of grace. Hebrews 12, 24, and Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Hebrews 13, 20. So when did the covenant start? It started at the cross. Started at the cross. It started at the cross, but so did the testament. The testament and the covenant are one and the same. The testament is preached to the Gentile. The covenant is preached to the Jew, but it's the same blood, same sacrifice, same Savior, no difference. But what has the Jew done to the covenant? He's rejected it. That's the blood covenant. He's rejected it. So what happens to him? God blinds him. And then the day will come when God will write in their heart his laws. And then their mind his laws. 
So what does that say for us tonight, Gentiles? It says that our salvation, we read the words and we receive the words. But these words are spirit and they are life. It'll do something for your spirit. They're alive. The word of God is quick. They're alive. And this is why he said to Lazarus, he said to the rich man in Luke 16, rich man said, send my brethren that he may warn, uh, let me tell my brother that he may warn these, my brethren these, that this awful place of torment. The Lord said, Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. If they won't believe Moses and the prophets, they will not believe the one were coming from the dead or raised from the dead. You'd say, you think, preacher, the resurrection of the dead would be such a profound thing that I would get saved if I saw that happen. Would you really? Hebrews, uh, Re uh, Revelation chapter 13 says that his deadly wound was healed. Talking about the Antichrist. But Moses and the prophets is the living word of God. If you will believe Moses and the prophets, which is the foundation for all of this, you have received life. There is no greater life than to receive his word. It's alive. If you believe it, it's alive. It'll give you life in your very soul. You see what I'm saying? You can be fooled by a miracle. You will never be fooled by life. You will never be fooled. So you believe the Bible tonight? I believe it. Believe it and love it. This is the book. There's no book like this book. It's alive. You know why you don't read it as much as you ought to? Because when you pick it up and you start reading it, it starts reading you. <laughs> That's why. You get uncomfortable with it, don't you? So what does that mean? That means you read it and get right with God and we're blessed by it. If you read it and you're, and, and, and you're uncomfortable and you don't get, uh, and, you, and therefore you're not going to be blessed of God, you throw it away. <laughs> and because you can't read it. It just, you can't, you can't appeal to it. You can't, you can't deal with it as you would a book on hunting or a book on shooting or, or physics or science or something like that. You know, something that has no direct, uh, there's nothing wrong with any of that stuff, but there's nothing spiritual about it. But this book is. Father, bless your word. Thank you tonight, Lord. There's such a thing, as these things, that you made provision for all of us. There's no question about that. And every last one of us are judged by the judge that can only judge the human spirit. And Father, tonight I pray that you'd bless everyone that's coming to this house. Remind us while we're here, Father. Remember, we remember the one who went to the cross. Bless his righteous name. In Jesus' name I pray. Now folks, if you'd like to come down here and pray with me tonight, before we have the Lord's Supper, and the reason we do this is over here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. If you look at that, the Apostle Paul talks about them having a, essentially just a feast. They turned the Lord's Supper into a, just a, a, a kind of a, you know, feast. And it lost its meaning. We don't take the Lord's Supper to fill our bellies. <laughs> we take the Lord's Supper to remind us in our soul and spirit why we're here and what he's about. Um, he said, uh, he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Uh, you don't have to do this tonight. You're welcome to do it. If you're born again, we encourage you to do it. You don't have to be a member of this church. We encourage you to do it because it is a blessing in it. It's a closeness with the Lord God. If you're not saved, just observe. That's the best thing to do. And just observe it. And uh, there's no problem with that whatsoever. If you are born again and you think this is just another meal, you've lost the meaning of it entirely. You don't have any idea of what's going on here tonight. We don't eat this physically to sustain us. This is done tonight for spiritual edification. So the apostle says in 1 Corinthians 11, that uh, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. All right. Would anybody like to come down here and pray? Would anybody like to come down and pray with us? We'll have an altar prayer and then we'll, we'll get into the Lord's Supper.